So, boys, girls, spirits and demons, welcome back to another Devilish Serpents video. My name is Jacob, keeper of the hognose and the face behind Devilish Serpent. I am here today recording uh, a very long in the works hognose care guide, full hognose care guide. I've been working on it for so long, at least, at least a year and a half. I did a speed read of it about a week ago and it was it took me an hour to really quickly read it so i have no idea how i'm going to even make this video a consumable piece or i just upload it as the monster it currently sits at so you'll know as you're watching this video how long it's going to be sorry if it's long but i will timestamp everything so you can get to whatever information you need the reason one of the reasons it's taken me so long to make this is i kept changing my mind about things my care for my hognose has changed so much after the last two years. Things that I didn't think would change. So this video will go into my care for these animals and my opinions on how you should care for these animals and some of the things are just that, opinions. Different breeders have different opinions, different keepers have different opinions and like I said, your opinion will change over time. It will keep changing. It's actually best to watch multiple care videos or care guides, read them from as many keepers and breeders as you possibly can to compare everybody's thoughts and then you will find your own preferences over time. I have experimented with every type of enclosure, feed and schedule, every type of prey item, every all types of heating. Every aspect of my keeping I have experimented with in some way or another trying alternatives and I'm going to present to you today my preferences for all of them as well as other options. I found what's best through trial and error for me in my setup. It could be different for you. Look, whatever uh, length this video turns out to be, I didn't want to make another 10 minute care video of regurgitated information that you can get from a simple Google. This is an A to Z care guide where you can return in the future if you need a bit of information on this. Hopefully, you know, you think devilish serpents has has his monster care guide i can come back and have a little look and see if he has him some information also i'm a big practitioner in practice what you preach and if you haven't practiced it don't preach it i feel like i couldn't make this care video until i had a few years of caring for hognose under my belt there's too many care videos done by beginner keepers what advice are they giving Where's this advice coming from? From Google, unfortunately. There will be times in this video where I talk about something I myself doesn't, don't practice, I'm not experienced with it, and I will link to another creator's amazing uh, video and discussions on it so you can get a better idea, some more advice. And so another disclaimer is I'm not a qualified vet. If you need medical advice, please go to an exotic vet. Another disclaimer is I will not be going into breeding in this care video. I've only had one breeding season under my belt. And again, the same sentiment. How could I give a breeding guide if I've only done one season? It doesn't make sense. I'm not experienced at it. I cannot give advice on it. So the very first chapter of this video I'm gonna make is to do with money. This is a very general point and that is you need spare money to keep reptiles. As mean as it sounds, as mean as it sounds, you can't be in a position where you're living hand to mouth, struggling to pay bills, and you go and get reptiles. If you have no money, there's just no possibility you're going to be able to give it the best care. For example, it's why Christmas pets normally go uh, unwanted, is you get a hog nose for Christmas from your parents, that's fine, the family's chipped in and they bought you an enclosure, um, a little bit of food. Everything's fine, you've got it all for Christmas set up. Suddenly, there's a scent gland blockage that needs an exotic vet's uh, skill set. Right, we can't go to an exotic vet because that costs hundreds. What if your heating system decides to break? Because all equipment can go faulty. You've got to be ready to replace any equipment at, at a moment's notice. If the heating equipment goes, you need to replace it. And that's why a good chunk of ethical breeders, that's a very broad term and it's chucked around too much, but I'll use it for this example. That's why ethical breeders 
will not sell cheap snakes is there needs to be a paywall behind it and this sounds mean but if you don't have enough money to buy a snake for you know a hundred plus then you shouldn't be involved with the responsibility this is a luxury being able to keep reptiles and snakes and you shouldn't come into this thinking you can earn money off of them either it's a very bad mindset to have when taking care of animals so what is a hognose the hognose is a species of snake with actual different subspecies under the hognose mantle but we're talking today about the plains hognose the western hognose it's normally called but it is actually called the plains hognose it's native to areas from the bottom of canada all the way to mexico it likes dry sandy places uh, almost desert like places you can find them in wetlands very swampy places uh, but they do prefer the sandy and gravelly area. The rear fanged venomous colubrid. These rear fangs uh, secrete a very mild venom. Instead of like a cobra, where the fang is hollow and it injects as much venom into you as possible, as quickly as it can, within a second, it stumps, you know, like a gallon, that's an exaggeration, but a gallon of um, venom into you. Hognose bites down and chews. It stays there and they have little grooves in the back of their fangs where the venom secretes down. A lot of people like to say it's a, a saliva that has venom in the saliva. This is a myth. I don't know where it's come from. It is a venom. It is 100% a venom, just a very mild venom that is not deadly to humans. For example, if your eye got bit, chances are nothing would happen. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, for me, because I know I'm not allergic, is I might get a bit of swelling like a bee sting. Very rare situations you could be allergic in specifically to colubrid venom. And yeah, that's dangerous. Less dangerous than a peanut. But it's good to know that no known deaths have ever happened that has been linked to a hognose bite at all. It just never has happened. They're so mild that most countries do not consider them venomous dangerous animals in the grand scheme of the jungle these are tiny snakes females fu fully grown are two to three foot on average with the males normally being like one foot one and a half foot they this is the general there are exceptions to this of course i have an old man of a hognose the oldest male in my collection is smaller than any other sub adult i've ever had he's tiny and he's just a small snake Whereas I also have a male that is mistaken for a female on first look because he's so big and he's just naturally bigger. Average life expectancy is 15 to 20 years. So this is a long-term commitment. This isn't a Christmas present. This is, you've really got to think, am I going to be, a, am I mentally going to be able to give this the same level of enthusiasm and care in 20 years time? Because that the snake demands that from you. They are infamous for flattening their necks when they feel threatened or in danger and people refer to this as hooding up because it's like a little hood. Mm -hmm. Myth dictates that they're trying to imitate a cobra. It is just that, a myth. There's nowhere in history that the hognose gene pool has been beside the cobra gene pool so it can't imitate something it's never met. It is just a evolutionary coincidence where they're trying to make themselves look as big and as threatening as possible to make that eagle double think about this, to think it might put up a fight. So they normally display colors of tan and brown. Um, there's localities, you know, different places in the wild will have slightly different colors. And that's how the first few morphs were found was you, you find these animals in the wild that have mutated their, um, their genes a little bit. So some of the wild types can have more yellows or more greens or more reds or just brown. They get their names from their upturned uh, snout. So their little nose scale is their namesake. They look like a little hog, a little piggy. It makes them superb burials. They can dig in sand and dirt. And that's actually how they like to eat their food pretty much is they'll find an amphibians, amphibians in holes or very small rodents in holes or eggs in the holes and sort of just trap them there which is why they're not a hunt like they don't chase prey they just stumble across it enclosure size now we get onto the the more argued stuff 
After lots of experimenting with enclosure size for a few years now, I have come to the conclusion it can be whatever you want. It really can. Forget about enclosure size and focus more on enrichment. Because if you've got a snake that and you've you provided it with a hot hide, a cold hide, and enrichment in the middle, the rub has to be big enough for the hides anyway, and the water pump. Now I'm not saying to take take the piss and put a hatchling in a 33 litre rub, because that that's not gonna work. And I'm not saying put a 450 gram four foot female hognose in a nine litre. But hognose can survive in large enclosures, especially with lots of enrichment. We'll talk about leaves, uh, wood decor, cork bark, branches, plants, cardboard tubes from like kitchen roll and toilet roll, perfect. I use them constantly because it's just free enrichment and my snakes love it. Uh, Vlad is always in his uh, toilet, his kitchen roll holder. The only thing I like to remember is the bigger the enclosure, the more space the hog nose has to hide from you. So if there's a reason that you wanna get it out for handling or you need to inspect it or it's cleaning time, if you have a massive enclosure with lots of enrichment, you have to tear up that enclosure just to find the hog nose. And this is gonna really stress the snake. If you, they can feel their home being torn apart for 15 minutes and they're, they're deep hidden under the substrate and they hear all this commotion, it's not nice for them. But they don't need the tiny enclosures that some breeders will suggest. And I say breeders because it's not very often that a private keeper will suggest a tiny enclosure. I think from a breeder's point of view, you, if you go home with your first hog nose and you put it in a very small enclosure, there's very little room for error with how you set up their enclosure. And it means you're not messaging the breeder and the breeder doesn't have all these new hog nose owners messaging him, my snake's not eating, my snake's not happy. So for reference, here's the sizes I use. I use really useful tubs, which I'll get onto later. But for hatchlings, I use one and a half litre rubs. They're really nice, they're longer as well. So I use heat mats. So when they're on the heat mat, the water bowl is far away from it so it doesn't mist up the enclosure and give them infections. Once they're confident feeding, and um, you get to know the snake and you know you think okay they're acting a bit more confident now i'll upgrade them straight to a nine liter with two hides a bowl and lots of leaves and enrichment once hoggies normally about a year's old a yearling they normally move up to an 18 liter especially if they can't fit in the small bowl in the nine liter without emptying it they'll move up to that 18 liter straight away and then uh, really 24 and a half litre rubs for fully grown males and 33 litre tubs for females. And what's funny is some breeders will think I'm very overkill with the room I'm giving my hog nose, whereas private keepers will probably be on the more on more of the side of they're pretty small enclosures. So it's for me it was finding that balance of giving my hog nose room um, without giving them vast expanses of space to hide from me. Also rubs are brilliant, I really like them and we'll get into that later. Of course, translate this to traditional vivariums and you won't find anything as small as some of the rubs you can get. So that's also something you have to think about. And on that subject, let's talk about enclosure types for your hog nose. So before I start, regardless of what enclosure, it needs to be very well ventilated. With my rubs, I drill lots of holes in the side and the top of the rub and um, I can't remember the name of it. I use, it's almost like a fabric, sanding fabric, not sandpaper, but it's a fabric that I use to then sand the edges down so they're not sharp. Some people use a soldering iron to melt holes through the plastic. You need to keep humidity low. Uh, you wanna aim between 30 and 40% with it never going over 40% humidity in your hog noses environment. The most common enclosures are fish tank, traditional vivarium, rubs, and rack. So first one out the gate, I hate fish tanks for reptiles. They rarely have secured tops. Every single week, if you're in a hognose forum, every single week someone will be posting somehow their hognose got out of their fish tank enclosure. They are not secure in the slightest. If you decide to use heat mat for the heating and it malfunctions, 
that bottom pane of glass essentially becomes a frying pan for the Hogno. And then another con is it's a opening, it's a top opening enclosure, which really stresses Hognos. They're very exposed on all sides of the tank. So if you are gonna use this, it's normally recommended that you um, cover up three sides of the fish tank so they're not so exposed. And congratulations, you now pretty much have a traditional vivarium without the pros of it. A pro of fish tanks is they're so cheap, they're normally given away for free on Facebook Marketplace or whatever. You can get lots of different sizes and they're just so available to everyone. Traditional vivarium, a solid choice. Most have purpose-built seals for wires, for your heating and thermostats, everything like that. They, can, they normally come with or you can buy purpose-built locks for the sliding panels so your hog nose can't escape. They are wildly available already set up in full kits for Spain. Front face and sliding doors means your hog nose isn't gonna get triggered every time you open the top, like a, like a top opening enclosure. You can just slide the door open and put your hand in instead of coming like that. The hog nose don't like it. If you're hippie inclined, like to walk barefoot, you can read into choice space handling for hog nose if you so wish. Um, not my thing. No offense. The thing is, I found vivariums the biggest pain in the ass to clean out because it's wood. You know, glass and plastic is very easy to clean and disinfect. Wood I found a little bit harder. Really scooping the corners out of a vivarium can be a bit of a pain in the ass. But it's a third world problem. It's not. It's not a real problem, is it? You just got to work a little bit harder to clean it. Obviously, this is your best choice for if you're using heat lamps. They're purpose built for heat lamps and the wood keeps the heat in really well. That wood is a much better insulator than glass or plastic, obviously. A traditional vivarium, wooden vivarium, arguably is the best for bioactive as well, which is the best way to keep in any hog nose is bioactive, any reptile for that matter. Rubs, my preferred choice of keeping now. I love rubs. Rub stands for really useful box. It's a British, British brand of storage boxes that the snake community in England uses universally. They are a very strong solid plastic that doesn't break easy, it's not very brittle. It makes a fantastic gradient when using a heat mat as opposed to a heat lamp. They're so cheap for an enclosure. They come in so many sizes and colors, so you can always have more than you need to move your hoggies up in size. It's very cheap, efficient, and easy. The locking handles on top are very strong, very grippy. I've never had a hognose escape. Never in the years I've been doing this now, never had a hognose escape on me. And people say I'm, I'm speaking bullshit, um, especially in forums. Tell, tell someone in a forum, I've never had a snake escape, and they're like, oh, you're lying. It's like, no, I just use very secure enclosures. They're so easy to clean. It's just one unit. You take everything out, disinfect it, scrub it a bit, hose it off, you're done. A massive con to this is their top opening. So your hog nose will get stressed when your hand's coming in from the top. They think you're an eagle. Um, yeah, but it's the only con I can think of apart from they're not very aesthetically pleasing. If you're looking for something to put in your living room or somewhere in the house, lots of people are gonna see it. This is not the option. They don't look great. Um, I love them though. They're in my snake room. Uh, their purpose isn't to show it off to anyone. Racking. Racking is great for two things, space efficiency and cost efficiency. You only need to worry about racking if you're breeding lots of clutches every year and you, you have tons of hog lows, then it's time to think about racking. This is just a breeder's domain and there's no reason to choose this unless you're a breeder, unless you have that many uh, hog lows. I have quite a few and I guess you could call this racking but it's just shelving uh, that is very customizable. I can move all the shelves up and down so I can change the size of the rubs to what suits the snakes. Um, traditional, like real true racking is an all-in-one purpose-built unit. Pro to racking is like the rubs, it's a single piece of plastic, every enclosure, so very easy to clean. Now it's something I have no data for, it's something I cannot prove, but there is a distinct difference between the snakes I have that I've raised from hatchlings and the snakes I have that I bought as adults from racking. 
I know they lived in Racking before I had them and it's very obvious. They're almost untamable. The ones I've raised from hatchlings are very calm, very rarely ever bluff strike me. And you know, they see me, it doesn't, doesn't change their day, they tolerate me fine. The two snakes I have that I know were in, in dark racking uh, cannot tolerate me at all. Um, bluff strike me as soon as I uh, open the lid and really don't want to be with me at all. And it's the only difference is they lived in non-transparent racking for the first uh, two to three years of their life. This also could just be from them not being socialised because they come from breeders with a lot of snakes to handle. Substrate. Substrate is actually a really important one because there's a lot of wood types that are poisonous to hog nose and they actually will kill your snake. So there's three options in my opinion. First one being Aspen. Uh, it's my favourite. It's, uh, yeah shavings from an aspen tree. It's really soft for your snake, but it's dry. Uh, it keeps humidity exactly where it needs to be. It's very light, so you can spot clean it very easily. And it contains feces and water to very small amounts. It's very absorbent. It's so good with containing water and uh, all, the, all the poopsies that come out of your snakes. It will hold the tunnels, your snakes digs as well, which is awesome. You with my rubs I can lift them up and see like it's like an ant farm the tunnel network under the snake. Aconovis is aspen is so dusty it, it's not nice for the room it's in the dust gets everywhere. Lignocell is the next one it's like it's almost like aspen but it feels very synthetic it doesn't feel like real wood. It is very easy for spot cleaning and it's dust free however it can't hold the tunnels that your hog nose likes to dig. And Lignocell goes everywhere because they're tiny little chips. Every time you move any of it, the whole house has got Lignocell in the carpet everywhere. I don't know how it happens, it just does. The a thing I don't like about Lignocell is um, it stays wet. If they spill a little bit out of their water bowl, the Lignocell stays wet and uh, goes a bit funny quick. Like you have to catch it within hours otherwise it's growing stuff already the dampness eco soil clay mix the most realistic substrate you can use for your snake so it is unarguably the best one you could use for the snake uh, without thinking about convenience to you they can still dig in the soil and feel really stimulated they can use their nose scales to move the dirt you know kind of recreating what they would be doing in the wild a little bit. Whenever you replicate the wild for these animals, that wins. That always wins by default if you can replicate the wild. I've seen some keepers will fill the bottom with eco soil and then the top with aspen. So there's a bit of, bit of both worlds there, best of both worlds. I personally use aspen. It's wildly available, it's cost effective, the hockeys love it, and that's just my choice. Aspen, every time, unless they're sold out, and then I'll pick the myself. Lighting. I personally let the seasons of Central Europe just dictate the lighting to me. Um, if they want a brewmate, they can brewmate during the winter when it is winter here in Central Europe. Every winter, my hoggies try and brewmate themselves anyway, so I, m I might as well give in to that eventually. Um, although I haven't done yet, I've never brewmated them yet. But look, if you live somewhere where it's summer, 666 days of the year, then you can falsify the lighting and make artificial lighting for your hoggies. Obviously you want to block out any natural light coming in because um, this will mess it up. You need a timer and some artificial light. In the summer, provide 14 to 16 hours of light during the day. In the winter, you're only gonna provide eight to 10 hours of light. And it's as simple as that. That's how to create a summer versus winter situation. Albino light sensitivity. Keep in mind, like all animals, the albinos of hog nose are very sensitive to light. You do not want to have harsh light sources pointed at the ho albino hog nose. You need to make the light source very indirect to the hog nose. I've actually seen this re very recently, someone on the hog nose Reddit, um, I think it was the hog nose Reddit, or Facebook, I don't know. Their snake was acting very strangely and everyone was like, it's an albino and there's very bright light shining on it. It's having a reaction to the light. They, it makes them, feel very uncomfortable. Heating. Now here's a war with very loyal combatants on both sides of the picture. So hognose are burrow burrowers 
a lot of people argue that they would prefer to borrow to the heat mat rather than a heat lamp, which makes no sense in the wild. There is no magical heat sources in the ground, enough for them to digest food anyway. They would have to sit in sunlight or under a rock to try and bask some heat. While I usually agree that replicating the wild is best case scenario, I don't think this one matters that much. I think as long as your hognose has a consistent area to heat up when it needs to, we're okay. I will add, basking is necessary in the wild, but it, they don't enjoy it. It's a natural time of vulnerability for a hognose snake. For most snakes, any snake that isn't top of the food chain, basking is a very vulnerable time for them. Whereas with a heat mat, they can go under their hide and you know they feel all comfortable and hidden while they're digesting a meal, which is why I prefer heat mats and not bas basket lamps for hognose. So although, yeah, in the wild they would have the equivalent of the basking lamp so they could go out in the sun and bask, I prefer to give them that heat in a more comfortable way than what they have to deal with in the wild. As I mentioned, some people use both a heat mat and a heat lamp, which is undeniably, undeniably the best way to go about it. The hognose can choose itself then what it wants to do. Unlike some other snakes, hognose do not need UVB lighting to survive or even thrive. They can thrive without it, it's no problem. But UVB lighting is proven to be beneficial to any reptile whatsoever. So not having UVB lighting will not affect your hognose profoundly in any way. But if you're looking to make the perfect utopia, you might want to include it. In the description, I have linked a video discussing the science behind UVB lighting on reptiles and why it is so beneficial. It's a very well made video and I suggest you check it out. For the hotspot, it is recommended to keep it at 30 to 32 degrees. I am from the UK, so yes, 30 to 32 degrees. I will transfer it into uh, American metrics, Fahrenheit, Celsius, whatever. I actually like mine uh, a degree or two slightly hotter than that. Um, I like my hognose seem to prefer it slightly hotter. The feeding responses are better and yeah, everything just goes more smoothly. Whatever your heat source is, it needs to make a gradient across, across the enclosure with one side being 32 degrees and it gradually getting colder along the enclosure so the snake can decide what temperature it wants to be. Enrichment. Enrichment is so important to a relaxed and happy hognose. Kitchen roll and toilet holders, toilet roll holders, like I said, are just three brilliant bits of enrichment that everyone has access to, I hope. It's free enrichment. I have some hognose that will not remove themselves from their kitchen roll holders. Leaves and plants are great. I prefer artificial leaves and plants because they can be cleaned and disinfected and reused again because the snake will poop on them. The snakes will poop anywhere. Branches and bark is really uh, good for enrichment as well. I always prefer to buy it from a reptile store or order it online because I can't tell my trees between a, a Satan and Lucifer. I cannot look at a tree and be like, yes, that's a Lucifer. Oh, that one's a Satan. Oh, that one's an Abraham. I just, I don't know. There's so much wood toxic to a hog nose, you need to be able to know. I love branches because they really break up the enclosure and add some verticality to it. Hognose aren't made for climbing, they're not designed to climb, and they're not a uh, climbing species, but they most certainly can climb, and they prove it every single day. You'd be surprised at how well they can climb and get out of enclosures. Hoggies don't need to climb to be fulfilled, but they can. Of course, everyone should know they need a hide on both the hot end and the cold end, and a hide in the middle if possible, with the water bowl and everything fitting in nicely. I like, I've started to enjoy hides in the middle because then a hog nose can be halfway across the gradient, heat gradient, and still relax uh, in peace. When buying hides, it's good to know that snakes love to feel the side of their body squished up to the sides of the hide. They don't like massive hides because that defeats the purpose. They want to feel like cuddled almost and secure. I prefer rectangle hides. I've, I've used the circle hides exclusively in the past. I found the snakes do not feel as comfortable in them because no matter what position they're in, they can see the light coming in and they can always see out of the door. With the rectangle ones, they can shoot their head around the corner and because they can't see anything, they feel, they feel more relaxed. Diet and feeding. 
So recently my entire opinion on feeding has changed quite dramatically. I use mice as a staple for the hognose diet, but not exclusively mice anymore. I now use salmon to supplement the hognose with lots of, lots of beneficiary um, nutrients. I just made a whole video about this looking into hognose diet. Uh, so go and check that out if you're interested. But don't use a size chart. They're almost always wrong. Every hognose is different. It can't be judged from a size chart. It's not that generalized. It is easy as get a prey item that's smaller than the hognose head. They have quite fast metabolisms. So I like to feed very small and often rather than trying to push how big it is. My hatchlings get fed every four days. All adults are fed every week, but the size of the prey is quite smaller than what others would give them. My females do actually get fed every two weeks because they take the, the biggest meal. Do not disturb for 48 hours after feeding. People are gonna be like, no, it's 24 hours, but I like to give them 48. Most care guides would say to only leave them for 24 hours and they're good. And this is mostly true, but I like to give them an extra day of not stressing them out while they're digesting. Again, let's do what's best for the snake and not what is more convenient for our wants. Some people I know do it really do it in a really nice way. They feed their hog nose and they will not handle them until they see them very active out and about again which is a faultless way of doing it. Calcium powder debate. Right, this is a debate with no conclusion to it whatsoever. Not enough study has been done with this. Basically, if you're going to use calcium powder on the hognose food, please use a calcium powder that contains vitamin D3. The snakes need the D3 to be able to process the artificial calcium. There's three sides to this argument. One, I see if you're having to supplement your snake's diet, you're doing something wrong too. It can't hurt to use every now and again, but you know, I don't see the harm, but what good is it gonna do? And three, definitely use it. I know this argument exists, because some videos I watch on here, some hognose meals look like they've been picked up from the desk on Wolf of Wall Street. Unnecessary amounts of calcium powder. I personally would not even bother when thinking about the general health of a hog nose. I've used it sparsely in the past, I couldn't observe any benefit. In the last two years, I've seen some disastrous clutches, egg binding, rotten eggs, eggs not making it to the end, from people who coat their meals in calcium powder. So it's very obvious calcium is not what these snakes are lacking, it's something else, because the higgery midjigiri rotten eggs are still happening. Nearly every time the breeding female was given Pablo Escobar levels of white powder. And yeah, no benefit whatsoever. Still issues, some deaths even. It's not nice. I just don't think calcium powder makes any difference. My hognose won't eat. You're not on your own. There are a plethora of reasons why your hognose might not want to eat. Most common reason is the enclosure is not right. Maybe they don't have enough enrichment. Maybe it is too big of an enclosure and you need to downsize for a little bit. Eating a meal and then digesting it is the most vulnerable a snake it's. In the wild, a hognose eats and then desperately finds somewhere to hide. Add some more hides, add some more clutter, see if this helps at all. Also, it could be your temperatures. Check your temperatures, not just the hotspot, but the ambient temperature. In my experience, my hognose will still eat without a hotspot if the ambient temperature is fine. If they have got their hotspot, but the ambient temperature in the room is low, they won't eat at all the ambient temperature is so much more important than you realize. If your hog nose is on a hunger strike and it's continuing to be on a hunger strike, stop handling it. The amount of people that handle their hog nose, be like, he hasn't eaten for four months, I get him out every day. It's like, no, stop. The whole idea here is to make him feel really secure and so he feels safe to eat. Stop handling him or her. I don't mean to gender this made, made up hognose. So that brings us to handling. Handling with hognose is extremely easy because they do not bite defensively. They bluff strike instead, which is essentially, they just try and headbutt you, just try and scare you. Their pointy little noses can like, like shock you sometimes. You're like, oh, is it biting me? And you're like, oh no, it's, it's the little pointy nose digging into me. At first, five minutes a day maximum with your hognose uh, until they feel more confident and they associate your smell with uh, a relaxed atmosphere. It could take two weeks to get to this point, it could take a year. Um, it's just whenever this snake trusts you. 
and tolerates you. Hognos also have very finicky personalities. A Hognos personality isn't for forever. I've had real calm, lovely um, queens of Hognoses overnight turn into absolute Gemma Collins, just total drama queens that want to kill me. And then I've had spicy little um, male Hognose that want to kill me and overnight turn into beautiful little cute kings that want to spend time with me. Don't hang yourself up if your hog nose doesn't like you. Newsflash, it will never like you. It will tolerate you. You're trying to get to your hog nose to a point where it doesn't care about you. It doesn't feel threatened by you. You're not trying to be friends with it. It can, will never think of you in that way. I just want to add, you want to pick up a hog nose with the center of its body. If you pick up too high in the body, they're gonna panic, they're very head shy. They don't want you touching their head. Um, same goes with if you pick it up by the tail, that's just very rude. They're gonna get stressed out and they're not gonna like that either. So under the body, in the middle, pick them up, very easy. We always want a hand and interaction to end on a positive note. If something does happen that starts with you with a hog nose, you want to just sit patiently until it calms down in your hand and then very calmly pull it back in its enclosure. You don't want to get startled and fling it back because then it will associate you with stress. Hognose have three behavior types. That's relaxed, stressed or hungry. These are the things your hognose thinks. Hognose do not have the same sentient capacity we do or dogs do or monkeys do or anything like that. They, they really don't. No matter what people tell you, they don't. These are the three things your hognose thinks. Relax mode is really nothing's going on. Everything's fine with the world. I'm in no danger and I love being alive. Stressed is obviously very easy to identify. They start the, the fluff striking. Fluff? Bluff striking? They start the bluff striking, trying to kill you, uh, trying to act like they want to kill you. So you will leave them alone so they can go back to being relaxed. I just want to point out here, um, is yes, it's very cute when your hognose plays dead, but this is the most stressed out your hognose can be. If your hognose is playing dead, it, it's physically impossible to stress it out more than this. As tempting as it is, because it is cute to start taking pictures and film this, just don't, just put it back in its enclosure and let it de-stress. I turn over in my metaphorical grave every time I see this on social media. Um, look, I've been guilty of it in the past. The first ever one that played dead on me, I took a picture straight away. I was like, wow, this is awesome. But as time gone on, I've and I've come to understand these snakes. They are so stressed in that situation that they want to play dead, that they're not even gonna fight back. They're just gonna hope if I play dead, this thing won't want to eat me. It isn't what's best for your snake to, to wind it up and record it. So just put it down. Your snake's well-being should always take priority. Hungry mode is very easy. Um, Astrid is is always in hungry mode. Um, all I have to do is bang my fingers like that and she tries to eat them through, through the plastic. Um, normally, if I touch her head, it snaps her out of it. She is also um, snake cook trained. So as soon as I touch her with a snake cook, she knows she's not being fed she's gonna to have to tolerate being handled for five minutes. Regurgitation. What to do if your hognose has regurgitated? First, yeah, first I'll cover what to do if you have a regurg incident and then I'll cover why it's happened. You'll be able to tell if your snake has regurgitated because the smell seems to have been borrowed from the depths of hell itself. I have never smelled anything like snake regurg in my life, apart from the, the portaloos at music festivals contends with it a little bit. Otherwise, you should see half a decomposed mouse on your next daily check. It's a partly digested prey item that your hognose has decided it cannot fully digest um, for whatever reason. Obviously, you need to clean the, the semi-digested prey out the enclosure, and then there is some important protocols to follow when this does happen. First of all, you want to minimize handling as much as possible. When a snake regurgitates, it does bring up the stomach acid uh, out of its mouth with the regurgitated mouth, and this burns the snake's mouth. Their acid is very strong, their stomach acid. Our, our stomach acid is very strong. This will burn the snake's mouth when this happens. Um, as you handle it, it can cause some discomfort. Because of this burning, they do need time to heal. 
Um, they need at least two weeks before you offer more food or start handling. When I do eventually offer more food after two weeks, it is always a hairless um, mouse. The reason for this is hair cannot be digested by um, hog nose. They norm my hog nose pass mice hair separately to feces. It's really weird, it looks like a furball. But yeah, it's, it's not good for the stomach. I also like to put them on paper towels during this process so I can see that they are pooping once again, uh, nice and healthy. So after two weeks, I've offered a small hairless mouse. Everything goes smoothly. I put them back in their normal enclosure with substrate. Everything's, everything's Gucci again. If your snake will not stop regurgitating, you don't need me, you need an exotic vet. Um, you need to get it there ASAP because this could be a bacterial infection or disease. Um, it could be um, things like crypto. Crypto is a type of disease that does make its way through the hognose rounds, unfortunately, and it has very weird side effects sometimes. Crypto is also, uh, there's, there's nothing you can really do about it. I know from experience, sadly, about the um, stomach bacterial infections with a snake, it was horrible to view. Uh, her health deteriorating because of it. Now, what causes regurg? Oh, well, there's four things that can cause regurg, really. Number one is the, just, just simply the prey item was too big and the snake has decided there's no way I can digest all of this. It needs to go. Number two is lack of heat. Um, if they don't have the right heat, um, they might decide that um, they can't digest it, so it's going to actually rot in their stomach. They have to bring it up. They can't let that happen. Number three is your hog nose is too stressed. It can get too stressed and regurge. This is because in the wild, if they've just eaten and something wants to attack them, they will quickly regurge the meal to make them faster. They need to be as fast as possible to get away. That is it. I think this would work for humans as well. If we're ever getting mugged, maybe we should just put our fingers down our throat, throw up. Musk, musk everywhere. Um, I'm sure the rubber would leave us alone. And number four is your hog nose has some sort of infection, disease, or yeah, you need to take it to a vet straight away if it regurges uh, a few times in a row. Female gland issues. Something I know a lot about because I have a female hog nose with a lot of female gland issues. I've done a whole video on this in the past showing you how to deal with female gland issues but I'll go over it briefly here as well. I have a female hog nose that had gland issues when I brought her. I didn't know about the issues until I turned up to buy her. Um, I fell in love with her anyway. She has a massive bump on the side of her cloaca where that's permanent, that will never go now. Basically what it is, is she has not released as much scent as she produces. Um, she's produced too much scent and it's backed up in her gland it compacts into a wax-like substance and can go pretty hard. For mold cases, uh, with like squashy, I just give her warm baths semi-frequently and it, that melts the waxy substance and she gets it out. So I just heat up some water, similar temperature to our hotspot, submerge her for 10 minutes, or just submerge the tail for 10 minutes and give it a little massage and then let it go on with it. If this looks like a more serious case or the baths just don't work, you need to go to a vet straight away. Unfortunately, in the more severe um, situations, this does need to be operated on. There is a line where if it gets too bad, there's no going back from it. You need to have it operated on. And I'm sorry to tell you that news. An easy way to avoid this with females is change their substrate much more frequently than you normally would. This will entice them to resent their substrate, stopping blockages from the same gland. I heard on a podcast uh, quite a while ago a very wild notion that someone only changes the substrate every time the snake sheds. That's crazy. Don't listen to things like that. Change it very regularly. I change my males uh, once every, well, once every month, once every three to four weeks, and my females every two weeks because of the gland issues. And you might think I'm being overkill, but once you've dealt with it, you will not want to deal with it again. It's not nice for your snake to have these issues. Shedding. Moist hired. I've seen some really wild videos on this website, to be honest, when it comes to hog nose shedding. I find it really simple. I just use a water bowl the snake can fit in, um, and the sheds are always perfect with mine. I've seen people misting their hog nose, misting the aspen. This is really unnecessary, and please don't mist aspen. You're, gonna, you're creating mold, not a moist atmosphere. Look, these snakes, 
um, in the wild will go to human areas um, for brief periods. They, they don't, they can't survive 100% in humid air. So actually, what is shedding? Basically, uh, you'll notice your snake's eyes turn blue, dark blue, and they can't really see. During this, they are actually blind, um, or blind, harder of seeing than they were originally. This can make them stressed and a little bit spicy during this period. With like my albinos, their eyes actually got a beautiful creamy colour like my Loki, like a pearl. It's really nice. A few days later, their eyes will go clear and then uh, their scales will be a lot darker than normal. Shortly after this, the skin sheds. They do this normally by rubbing the front of their face and getting it started and it all comes off. I never offer any humidity increase and 99% of my hoggies over the years have always perfectly shed. I at the moment have one snake that I have to offer um, a humid hide for two days maximum and that is Squashy, the problem hog nose. I, I find that generally hog nose are not good at using a humid hide within reason. They can't regulate it themselves at all. It's so comfortable to them they will sit in it until they can't breathe from a respiratory infection. Whereas you take something like a ball python, which can deal with moister environments anyway, will use a moist hide within reason and will we'll decide I'm done with that now. But yeah, don't be spraying aspen. Aspen will just go moldy. Let's talk about receiving your first hog nose. So new owners, listen up. When you receive your first hog nose, if it comes in the post or as a quick, quick transaction at a doorstep, this is what you need to do. You need to pick up and inspect the hog nose. Check for any damages on the scales. You wanna check their eyes specifically, check there's no funny business going on with their eyes. You wanna check for saliva around the mouth. Saliva around the mouth means respiratory infection. And you wanna check for any evidence of mites, the little black bugs that can infest reptiles. Look for any scent gland issues. This is something that plagues female hog nose that people don't talk about. Actually, it was only yesterday I was speaking to someone that had exactly the same situation I did, brought a snake specifically for a breeding project and she's got quite bad gland issues, very swollen cloaca and um, yeah, that snake's very lucky that they've got a, a nice owner to nurse them out of the situation. And the breeder didn't tell him at all. It's just, how, that's not ethical. I always like to get a shallow bowl or a plate and offer the hog nose some water straight away uh, maybe even something they can sit in because snakes love to absorb water through the cloaca. Right, they don't always drink it out through their mouths. Nearly every time I have took delivery of a hog nose uh, that has been delivered, they have drunk immediately. Next, put in their enclosure, say goodbye for two weeks. This is one of the hardest things to do, but it will be worth it. A lot of people say, I'll just leave them three or four days, leave them a week. Leave them two weeks. It's your best chance that they're going to acclimate to the new enclosure and take the first meal. Just leave them alone for two weeks. I know you want to handle them, but it's not in the best interest of the hog nose, which takes priority over our wants from these animals. You obviously, you can spot check and change water daily, but don't dilly dally around. Don't spend 10 minutes tearing up the enclosure looking for it. Just quickly. Any poops, no, change the water, done. Leave it alone. Obviously after the two weeks offer a meal, I personally like them to eat two meals in a row before I start a handling routine. It's much more important these animals start eating than socializing with us. Questions to ask a seller when you are inquiring about a hog nose. What are the parents and are they from the same bloodline? If so, how many generations have these snakes been lion bred? You only want two generations maximum. What am I even on about lime bread? Inbreeding. Inbreeding is very common in reptiles. It's not as disastrous as it is for us mammals. Um, it still has boundaries though. With hog nose, you only want two generations of inbred hog nose before you start seeing some side effects. You want, you want to ask if they're tongue fed or drop fed. There's nothing worse than a snake that only drop, drop feeds and uh, you're constantly trying to tongue feed them, stressing them out because they've never taken food like that in their life. Very important question to ask. You obviously want to ask if you they have a feeding record you can ask for. Obviously they can just make this up and lie, but it's better than nothing. And um, 
a good breeder will send it before you've even asked anyway. You want to ask what size enclosure they currently have, so you, you have some idea of what, how big are the changes this hog knows about to get. Have they lived in a one and a half litre like I keep my hatchlings in and you're about to pull it in at 18 litre? What is the change here? What's the size difference that you're about to impose on this snake? Morphs to avoid? Question mark. Luckily with hog nose, there isn't really any morphs that are inherently bad. Um, like some ball pythons, you cannot ethically breed them because the offspring would come out. Um, very special needs. There's some leopard gecko morphs that are inherently got neurological issues that is directly related to the type of morph. There are some rumours about the pink pastel albino hognose morph um, that it's linked to neurological issue. I think this is kind of a myth and it has kind of been dispelled over the years. I would actually bet my money this was the fact that PPA was always a rarer morph. There wasn't massive gene pools to work with and there was just too much inbreeding. It wasn't the morph inherently, it was breeders not having a big enough gene pool for the PPA morph. Which goes back to ask the breeders if they're if they're inbred. Lime bred is the, the, the more polite term, lime bred. Albinos are prone to bug eye, fish eye, whatever you want to call it in your community. I have Squashy, she has really bad bug eye, fish eyes. She is the most problematic hog nose on earth. It has impacted her life in no way whatsoever. She is a normal albino, she can't have bright lights, but yeah. Having bulgy eyes is, hasn't affected her life. But say I decided to breed Squashy, her children could have even worse eyes and so on. This this just not ethical to breed her. I've seen people get to the end of a lime bread project and the eyes are exploding when they hatch and they've uploaded the pictures quite proudly. Um, it's not great, it's not nice to want. Where to buy your hog nose? Well, there's a few places and some are better than others. Private breeders that are very open about their practices and how they keep their hog nose are gonna be the most ethical and have the healthiest snakes. That is just a fact, I'm afraid. Instagram is a really popular hub for breeders to show off what they have and their setups. And it's a great place for you to interact with anyone that you potentially could be purchasing a snake from. You can get a good idea of what setup the breeder's currently running. You can get a good idea of their cleansiness. If you get a vibe that the breeder is being very lazy with the care, or they're very obviously doing everything as cost efficient as possible at the expense of the snake, give them a wide berth. I'm not gonna name anyone, but there's a couple of well-known breeders that come to mind that the racking that the snakes are kept in are filthy. The room that they're kept in hasn't been cleaned in months. Uh, the, the substrate hasn't been changed in months. And somehow there are big names in the community. Please do your research. Do not give these people your money. Corporate pet shops, like in England for us, it's pets at home. In Germany, um, there's Freshnap. Freshnap? Is that the name of it? Maybe. Uh, I've never seen them actually have reptiles in the store. Though. But corporate pet shops are the devil. Avoid them at all costs. You never actually know what you're getting. They rarely ever know themselves what, what morph they have and what gender and all that. Just not a good idea. Unless you see one you really want to save. Look, you could go the adopting route. Adopting any animal is obviously great for the world. If you're not bothered about raising from a hatchling, uh, definitely look at some animal adoption sites. They're normally pretty cheap compared to, say, Morph Market or a private breeder. The only downside is you normally don't have accurate information about them because they've been taken out of shitty situations. If just owning a hognose snake is your goal and you don't need the first year or two of their life when they're a hatchling, definitely adopt. These snakes live for ages. You're still going to get a lot of value out of it. I take surrenders, but most people want money for snakes. Uh, that they don't care about anymore. Um, I don't have the money to spend on everybody's snakes that they can't, that they don't have enthusiasm for anymore. Morph Market is international. Morph Market, it requires some basic form of vetting from the seller. Um, generally a very scam free place to be. And it's very, it's, it's a lovely website. It's eBay for reptiles. It's got an easy layout and all the information you need is normally listed. It's, it's a fantastic website. Breeders on there will often have pet only hognose for sale. This will be hognose 
for example, their tail hasn't fully formed, so they have a perfect quality of life, but it would be unethical to breed them because they obviously, their genetics are not right. These snakes normally sell for a lot less because they are pet only and can't be bred. But if you're, if you're not looking to breed and you just want to own a hognose, this is perfect. You get a hognose with a lot of character and yeah, you're helping the community. Sexing, a more recent discovery with sexing hognose snakes is counting scales. What you do is you count the scales from the cloaca to the end of the tail down one side of the snake. Uh, no need for probing or popping or anything of the nature like that anymore. 39 plus scales on one side is a male. First, so 39 plus is a male. Anything less is typically a female. Females typically max out at 33 to 35 scales on one side. No one has found an exception to this yet, I believe. I'm going to link a Shovel Nose Hogs video he has a dedicated video on scale counting if you'd like to learn how to do this accurately. I tried to probe uh, a snake once and I hated it so much I really didn't want to do it. Um, it just uh, didn't feel nice. So the fact that scale counting come out not long after that, I was like, thank God for that. I really didn't want to shove things in my snake's uh, cloacres. Hognose weight, males tap out at about 100 grams, females tap out at about 300 to 400 grams. Don't worry or focus on the weight. Just feed consistently. Uh, you want slow, progressive weight being put on. You do not want fast weight being put on. Power feeding is a really big issue um, in the breeding world that we don't want to contribute to at all. And look, these snakes grow forever. They tap out at 100 grams or 300 grams, but they will slowly grow for the rest of their life every year. Every snake shed, they've grown a little bit. There's exceptions to this. Like I said in the beginning of the video, I've got males. I've got a male that tapped out at like 70 grams. I've got a male that taps out at 160 grams. There are exceptions to this for Dealing with mites. It's not always easy to identify a mite, but I find hognose one of the easier species uh, to see them. This is thanks to the killed scales. They can't hide under the under a scale like they can with a ball python. It's not really possible for the mites to wedge themselves out of sight. As the hognose move, they start running about because they're suddenly exposed. But the easiest thing to notice them on a hognose is every hognose I've seen with mites spends all day submerged in their water bubble. This is to try and suffocate the mites, mites because the snake is uncomfortable with them. Um, and you can normally see uh, loads of little drowned mites in the water bowl. Especially if you, if you have like a light coloured water bowl rather than black ones I have, which maybe aren't the best idea. So mites most dangerously transmit diseases from reptiles to reptiles. Um, they also eat the skin of, of, of snakes, uh, cause bleeding, cause infections, just all around nasty business you do not want on your snake. The long winded treatment, which has always been around for treating snakes with mites, is... Um, very washing up liquid baths, dawn, like dawn washing up liquid baths for you Americans. Um, coconut massages, coconut oil massages. You're gonna have to disinfect enclosures very thoroughly, which is almost impossible with a vivarium because the mites get into the wood. And it's just, yeah, it's not great. However, if you are in the UK or wider Europe, there is an easier method. Taurus predatory mites is basically a bucket of sawdust with a special type of mite inside that only target other mites. They are not interested in your snake, they are cannibal mites. So as counterproductive as it seems, you pour in more mites, these special type of mites into the enclosure, three to four days, you have no snake mites left. I guarantee it, I promise you. I had a really bad um, mite outburst with my collection due to negligence on my part, and I brought in these predatory Taurus mites, three to four days, there was no longer any snake mites anywhere near my snakes. I couldn't believe how fantastic it worked. Obviously, once the snake mites are dead, the Taurus predatory mites have no food source and they die off themselves anyway within a few days. Please note, even if using your, your predatory mites, you're always gonna have to throw away cork bark or branches when you have a mite infestation because they can hide in the wood. Because I've never dealt with snake mites in the traditional way, I am going to link two videos um, in the description with people doing it the traditional way 
if you don't have access to Taurus mites. One's from Snake Discovery, one is from New England Reptiles. Both are treating rural pythons or pythons in general, um, but it is transferable knowledge that you can then uh, pass on, uh, give aid to a hog nose dealing with it. Brumation, such a big topic. Um, I said at the start of the video, my motto is practice what you preach and if you don't practice it, don't preach it. I have never brumated my snakes. I've never found it necessary. Uh, I had one, one breeding season that I've completed so far and it was successful without brumation, um, but never been inclined to. I, there's just not enough evidence that it does improve fertility. S like so many breeders now don't bother. So many people that didn't do now. Blech. What is brumation? I'm, I'm ranting on what is brumation. Brumation is the reptiles version of hibernation. Hibernation is what mammals do. Brumation is what reptiles do. They reduce their heart rate to as slow as possible, reduce their movements to nearly no movements at all, and essentially stay still underground for months at a time in, in the wild. Because I can't preach what I've practiced, I'm linking two videos for this one as well. One is from Snake Discovery, talking about brumation in a two part, there's two parts to that video. Um, can't go wrong with Snake Discovery really uh, reliable information. The other video is from JMG as well. Just weirdly, he just uploaded a video on how he brumates his hognose. He is unarguably the authority of hognose. Um, currently, probably the biggest breeder there is with hognose. And he has some great insights with how they would brumate in the wild and how you should brumate your snakes as well. Water and hydration. So I always think it's best to use a water bowl the snake can fit in. I actually hear some people saying, no, don't let the snake sit in the water bowl all day. But I see no issue with it. They like to uh, hydrate themselves through their cloaca as well, which is a reason for doing this. Fresh bottled water is the best. This is very manageable if you only have one or two hog nose. It, that obviously becomes unfeasible once you have four, five, six, seven, eight plus hog nose bottled water will break the bank. UK tap water is fine to use. Unfortunately, American tap water has a lot of chemicals in it. Um, is generally not advised given to a hog nose. Obviously you can buy water, like water filter jugs, uh, which is great for long term. Here in Germany, they are very proud about how pure and healthy, drinkable the tap water is. So I have no problem with that at all. My hog nose has escaped what the hell do I do? First thing is to calm down and think methodically. Um, it's not the end of the world. This happens to so many people. Do a base search of the snake around its enclosure and the room the enclosure's in. Importantly, you need to identify how it's escaped to rectify that so that it doesn't happen again once you find it. Some information I've been told, if it does happen, is where you think they could be around. Set up a heat mat and a prey item on the heat mat. They will either want need the warmth or they will smell the mouse and want a bit of food. Wait and be patient is what I've been told. I'm preaching about something I haven't practiced, so I will link Snake Discovery's video on this, on finding your snake if it has escaped, because it's just never happened to me. I never had an escaped snake. Um, I'm a bit too um, OCD about their enclosures to have that happen. Quarantine. I cannot stress this enough, you need to quarantine new animals if you already own reptiles. I know this from personal experience when I gave my entire hognose collection mites. It was back when I had a massive collection before I moved to Germany because I was only allowed to bring five snakes into Germany from outside the country. Um, I had a massive collection, I had brought loads, I never had an issue, I got cocky, I just put a new couple of snakes in the collection and that a week later, the whole collection had a mite infestation. I acknowledge my mistake. It caused me a lot of stress to deal with and a lot of money. But I'm telling you out of experience, quarantine is a must. This is a separate room, a separate shelf, um, where new reptiles can live for two months, even longer, to really make sure they have no issues that they could be spreading to your other animals. Make sure you're cleaning your hands when dealing with the quarantine animals. Also. I can't believe we've got uh, towards the end of the video. Uh, my throat really hurts. I need I need a nap and, and some water. But uh, I just wanted to tell you that in the description, 
I am going to be linking some really cool content and resources about the Hognotes hobby. So first of all, I'm linking Dav Kaufman's video of Hognose in the wild. He has some absolutely fantastic insights on how they behave in the wild and he's out there. He is out in the Hognose habitat uh, looking at temperatures, uh, humidity, that sort of thing. Uh, the only problem is this guy has such a rich and big library of content. You will be watching him for hours, uh, but definitely check him out. He, he does so much work for the reptile hobby at Sunreal. Um, he has a real passion for it. I have also in the description linked um, some of the care guides that I trust and I think is solid advice that has some different opinions to me maybe um, because you should watch different care guides, compare the information and create your own preferences. So I've got a care guide from Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles. He's very knowledgeable. He's a very ethical reptile keeper. I've got one from Shovel Nose Hogs who has Hognose Care from a Novice, which is a fantastic uh, perspective to be looking at it from. I wouldn't call him a novice anymore. He's obviously been doing it for a little while now, but this video was made when he was a novice. Uncharted Wild Care Guide. This was the care guide I used um, when I first started getting into the hobby. So I wanted you guys to watch it. Lastly, I've linked my favorite Hognose specific YouTubers, YouTubers that specify and specialize in Hognose content. We've got Shovel Nose Hogs, Angry Hogs, and Heterodon Home, all great Hognose specialized content. Like I said at the beginning of this video, a lot of the things I've spoken about are personal preference and my own opinions when it comes to husband, husbandry and care for these Hognose snakes, these beautiful little creatures. It's time for you to watch the other care guides, practice some of these uh, things, and come up with your own opinions and preferences about your hognose and your husbandry towards your hognose. I hope this has brought some value to some people. Um, maybe you've watched it and you just thought it was interesting and you've been in the hognose hobby a while. Maybe you're thinking about getting a hognose or you've just got a hognose. I hope this video has helped you or entertained you or at least been interesting. The purpose of this video was not to uh, disagree with anyone else's opinions or preferences just to show mine and some options other than my own preference. Hopefully this can be sort of like a little hognose bible for new and potential hognose owners. Have fun owning and caring for this fantastic, very cute, beautiful little snake. Thanks for watching, uh, I need a whiskey.